All right. We are back again with our good friend David Moses. Ahoy. Who you, you, he just threw me off with that fucking ahoy. I'm sorry. I was in the middle of some shit. Oh, no. We're leaving that shit in. It stays. <clears throat> it fucking stands. I'm this sorry. aggression stands, David Moses. I'm sorry. So anyway, as I was saying, David Moses, you know him from our fucking shop comic. <laughs> You enjoy it. You got it free in your order. Maybe you got the first one. Maybe you got the second one. Maybe you'll get the third one and he started to draw. I might tell you about it if he doesn't interrupt me with some other horse shit. Anyway, we're back. <laughs> Our good buddy, David Moses. How you doing, David Moses? I'm doing great, Danny. How you doing over here? Fucking fantastic. Wonderful. I couldn't be happier to be sitting here with you. Likewise. Uh, we're we're going to talk about fucking um, Matthew Allison. Not fucking him. We're going to talk about... <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, Matt. We're not going to do that. <laughs> Matthew Allison, one yeah. of the great independent cartoonists of our time. Yeah. Truly. Uh, idea came up because you turned me on to the man. Yes, I did. I did turn you on with Matt. You turned me on with <laughs> Matt. And that's yeah. why I had the mistake of saying about fucking earlier. <laughs> because I was so turned on by <laughs> your representation This of is going Hay. great already. <laughs> yes, yeah, so... Um, Last time we podcasted together, yep. uh, I mentioned this um, Cancor Calamity of Challenge released by Ad House Books in 2020 as being one of my favorite books of the past year. Um, it's a collection of, uh, of four issues that Matt put out independently and had collected. Um, they're all fantastic. Uh, he, I came across him probably back in 2017 or 2018. And uh, immediately connected with his style, and he was kind of oh. showing off. Oh, uh, shit, some, I hate uh, to interrupt you, oh. but... Uh, Whoa. Yeah, we got a surprise. You're actually interviewing... Oh, Allison. shit. Yeah, that's actually what's going down. Oh, my... You're not going to talk to me about Matthew Allison, so I hope that you're fucking ready. Oh, wow. <laughs> well, I'm... How about that? How you hey. doing, Matt? I'm good. How are you guys doing? Uh, pretty good. Can you hear me all right? Yeah. We yeah, can we, now, yeah. We can now. We can hear you great. All right, so, perfect. Uh, now, I don't know if you're aware of this now, but I had not told David that he was going to inter- interview you. He thought he was coming here to talk about you with me, about our shared love for your work. And uh, we actually decided to surprise him with getting to actually talk to you. Well, this is quite a surprise. Because uh, David is the guy that I, I found out about you through when he uh, sang your praises on one of our podcasts previously. Oh wow, that's amazing! Yeah, I had no idea that this was going to be a surprise for anybody. I just assumed that uh, <laughs> that everybody would be in on it. Nope, for this so. guy it was a surprise. <laughs> I thought it would be super fun to be like, oh, by the way, you're actually interviewing him. So yeah, I just awesome. I just got a message from Joel saying one moment, and I was like, wait a minute, should I be talking right now? So, <laughs> <laughs> so well, we're excited you're here. Thanks for Thank coming you. on and doing this. I appreciate it. So, um, well, yeah, again, I we did a. We did a, we do a thing where we go to a, we take people to a local comic shop and we all pull stuff that we like and um, talk about books that we like. And he brought uh, Kanker with him, and then was kind enough to loan it to me, and I fucking loved it. So, and that's then great. that's when we had the idea to have you on. So uh, I'm gonna let you take it away. All right. Uh, welcome to Holy Mountain Podcast. I can't believe that this is happening right now. Um, and this Thank is you guys. Freaking awesome. Um, so you are one of my favorite cartoonists. I'll say that on, you know, very boldly. Shout out from the rooftops. Um, uh, can you kind of take me through a little bit how your style developed into the Cancor, um expression? Because you know, you I, I know that you were doing things in the '90s, and um, you know they were reflective of many different influences, and it kind of solidified into what we see as Cancor now yeah. so like how, how did that develop for you uh the the main way it developed for me was um you know letting go of some ideas about how i should be drawing um feeling like uh I, there were there were limits on uh on the the type of work i could be doing the type of characters i was creating uh and the, the biggest influence for me really was Dan Klaus and uh, eight ball um, because he put everything he wanted in that comic. If he wanted to throw superheroes in there, he'd throw superheroes in there. If he wanted to do an EC 
gnarly looking zombie, you know, that's drawn like Jack Davis, he would do that. And that was always in the back of my mind, even when I wasn't creating comics. So when I did finally sit down to do something and, and you know, actually print it, um, that was the, uh, the guide for me, just like, just do whatever you want to do because the, no, uh, the, the, the reality is that at that point when I was creating, nobody cared. So it, it didn't matter. And you always think people care, even if you're not even showing your stuff to people, you're just like, oh, somebody's going to hate this or think I've made a poor decision here. And you finally have to let that go and realize like nobody cares. You can just mm. do anything you want. So that was, that was very liberating. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, so that's the impression that I get when I began reading Cancor and, and even all the way through to Amnesis, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the latest release um, that you did uh, just last month, right? Yeah. 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 Um, which is a phenomenal, another phenomenal book. Um, Thank is, you. You know, it's, it is a uh, singular expression of Matthew Allison. You know, it's like you get full expression in these books uh, uh, of whatever you're going through and thinking. And that was one of the things that um, I found going through calamity of challenge is, you know, I feel like, uh, you know, I'm going through the struggle, uh, with you, you know, like you are sure. translating it to the page and, uh, very directly and at the, in the moment. And, you know, it, it feels like we're walking with you through this stuff. How did you, um, develop the ideas for, uh, calamity of challenge. Well, you know, now that you say that about the, you know, being able as a reader to, to feel that struggle, um, creating these books for me is not easy. It's not something I sit down and, and write out in a notebook or sit down with a, a you know, some sort of scripting software and, and work everything out ahead of time. It's all very push and pull and trying to extract ideas as they come to me and then piece them all together, almost Frankenstein style at the end. Um, there's nothing, there's no set theme. Even with this new book, Anamnesis, um, there's elements in there about misophonia, noise sensitivity. Like I didn't, I never set out to make the story about that. That was not my intention in the beginning. That was just something that came to me as I was working on it. And, uh, so, you know, each, each book that I've done was not created in any sort of linear fashion. I would, I would have a page or a panel that I was inspired to make. And then I had to figure out, okay, well, what leads up to this panel and uh, if I couldn't figure that out, I'm like, well, I'm going to have something that happened two days before this, and I'll try to work those two moments together um, in the narrative uh, as I draw. So, um, again, without having a script to go off of, it's it's very much, you know, catch as catch can in terms of ideas of, like, what is this character doing? What do they represent? How are they affecting Kankor? Um I don't really know that almost really till I get to the point where I'm coloring it and, and lettering it. Um, it's, it's, it's a very strange process compared to what I've seen other creators do. Mm-hmm. Um, I don't recommend it for anybody because <laughs> it can be very frustrating. Yeah. So you don't come in with a script beforehand. No, no. So you kind of Marvel method yourself. Pretty much. Wow. But even then with Marvel, you know, they would have more of a plot. Like I usually don't even have a plot laid out. I knew with this new book, I, I was like, I need a five minute or excuse me, five page uh, fight scene. That that was a, uh, well, that was one thing that I knew I wanted to put in there. And the reason for that was um, I had been reading some of uh, uh, this other cartoonist blog and he was talking about, um, uh, you know, his desire to be a, a more serious cartoonist and he didn't want to do superhero stuff and he didn't want to do five page fight scenes. And I, that just got it in my head of like, well, how can I fit a five page fight scene into this quote unquote serious comic? That was the, that was really the only challenge I set up for myself with this one. That was a really great part. And, and I uh, appreciated how you kind of shared the process um, on Instagram, you were posting, you know, some of the reference materials and how you were 
translating it into the comic um, that I always love seeing the behind the scenes stuff. Sure. I'm probably going to ask a couple of like, um, you know, craft questions as well um, okay. throughout this. But um, actually, one thing as I was looking through and comparing literally page by page, comparing, uh, you know, the first couple issues of Calamity of Challenge in the single issues to the collected edition, I mm-hmm. noticed that the font was different. Yeah. Um, for especially the first issue. And it seemed to me like you probably just wanted it to be like more continuous throughout, like more cohesive. But what, you know, like what were some of the, the, the choices that you made and the decisions behind making those choices for the collected edition as opposed to the single issues? Part of it was feedback that I got from friends and other cartoonists in terms of storytelling. You know, people were saying, well, this part's a little vague. It's hard to understand, you know, why these characters are doing what they're doing. Maybe clear this up a little bit. Uh, Something um, that I wanted to add um, was the there actually the the dialogue in the beginning or actually the narration excuse me in the beginning of the uh the ad house collected edition is completely different than what's in the original self-published issue and i had this story idea about um people watching that old program mass for shut-ins where it's basically you know church for people that couldn't leave the house for whatever reason and uh relating that to my situation in my twenties where I didn't leave the house. And the reason why I didn't leave the house is because I just, I felt protected there and I had all my, my stuff, my movies and my comics and everything. And it was just like, I was a a self-imposed shut in at that time in my life. So I just felt like that was a more appropriate way to start the story than the way I'd done it before. And being able to do that collected edition and, and make edits was nice because, because of the fact that I throw this together pretty much at the end of the creative process, having the ability to collect it all, take a look at it as one whole piece and then realize like, Oh, this part didn't really work. I can add more to it. Um, it, it just was an, a nice way to, uh, to redo some of that stuff. I wasn't ha- as happy with the first time around. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> yeah. You guys made a really incredible book. I mean, you know, the, Everybody, uh, you know, everybody agrees. Everybody, Thank you. everybody agrees. <laughs> I hope. <laughs> I mean, it's just kind of across the board. Everybody's like, "Oh yeah, this is the book." So, um, um, gosh, there's so many questions I could ask. Danny, do you have something while I he, sort them out? Yeah, it's it, what happens when nobody prepares you. you I know. <laughs> yeah, for real. It was too too good not to. <laughs> um, you know, I, when he loaned it to me and I you know, started looking at your work and, and again, I loved it instantly. Like, uh, you know, I, I, I see little, little bits of like, you know, like where you integrate like a, a Batman look into Kanker or like a bit of a Wolverine. And I was curious, you know, when seeing those, like what were the books when you were a kid? Like what were the books that got you into comics to begin with? Well mentioning those two elements of the story, having a Wolverine type character and a Batman type character, um, the, the books that made a huge impact on me as a kid. And when I say that, I, I mean, I, I'd been reading comics since I was very, very little, but when I started really getting into comics was I, when I was in sixth grade. And, um, that was when issue 400 of Batman came out, which is a jam issue. So you had maybe 20 different artists working on that book and they're all drawing batman in a different way which was pretty mind-blowing because at that point you know it was very much about having a house style and you 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 either had the adam west batman or you had the way that neil adams drew him which was very similar to to jose garcia lopez and you know that the the idea that you could interpret these characters the look of the characters any way you wanted as a form of artistic expression really hit home with me at that age. And at the same time, there were, um, two books that came out, uh, one called heroes for hunger and our heroes against hunger and one heroes for hope, similar thing. Um, you know, 
multiple interpretations of all those characters. And you had people like Richard Corbin, who I had seen Richard Corbin stuff in the back of Famous Monsters magazine when I was a little kid. I never made the connection that that was the same guy that was drawing the X-Men in this book until years later. But, you know, to have this underground, uh, more adult artist working on the superhero stuff was, uh, again, a uh, um, real eye-opening and, and a way for me to understand that you could be a uh, an, a, an artist that had an oddball style and still work for Marvel or DC. Um, and so that, that stuck in my brain of like, Oh yeah, you could, you can, you can do this. Um, so those, those three books, um, definitely made a huge impression on me. Yeah. That's awesome. I, I kind of on the same end, like, do you, are there any characters you would have interest, like a mainstream, like Marvel or a DC care? What would, what would be the characters if you were, you know, perfect world, you were handed the keys to any kingdom, what would it be? Uh, as far as DC, there's the character composite Superman, it's half Batman, half Superman. And uh, years ago, excuse me, there was a blog where people were submitting their ideas for New 52 books that happened around the time that the New 52 stuff was going on at DC. And that was my pitch of, of having just a really bizarre, you know, green person with a half Superman, half Batman costume. Um, Marvel. Um, I don't know. You know, those strange tales books that came out maybe 10, 15 years ago where they had all those alternative artists work on that stuff, like the Hernandez brothers. Um, just doing, if, if they ever did something like that again, uh, you know, I'd, I'd want to do something with uh, maybe Spider-Man or the Hulk, something like that. R the the real iconic characters. Sometimes it, in this current phase of, of your career, it's cool because we get to see your interpretation of some of these classic characters um, mm -hmm. because you're doing a lot of commissions, right? You're connected yeah. with Inky Knuckles art, yep. right? Yep. Um, so since the, that is a, you know, um, one of the main avenues of your artistry right now, what are the plans for Cancor in the future? You did this great, you know, Anamnesis is an excellent sort of coda to Calamity mm -hmm. of Challenge. Is there a continual story or is this kind of something that you want to bring to close as like a phase of life that it's it's done now or... What is Cancor to you now? Um, you know, I'm going to take a break from making new Cancor stories for a while, just because I feel like um, at the core of that material is me working through a lot of personal issues that I feel I've, I've overcome in the last few years. And there's a sense of... Um, I'm ruminating on, on the bad shit in my life and I need to put that in the past and move forward. That doesn't mean that Kankor can't do the same thing. I just haven't figured out how to make that happen for Kankor. And that's actually something my wife says to me a lot is like, why can't Kankor do something nice? Why can't he have a good day for once <laughs> and, and, uh, you know, not have it just devolve into chaos. But, um, I think that's in the, in, in the back of my mind is something that could happen. Um, in in the meantime, the plan is to do a collected edition of everything that I've put out myself, this material that was in the Ad House book, this new anamnesis, and then have uh, some more autobiographical stuff in between those stories, oh, and then yeah. put it all out as a hardcover and do a Kickstarter for it. Excellent. And I probably will do that next spring. Fantastic. Well, I'll definitely be signing up for that. And you're gonna are you gonna include the uh Van Halen versus the Clash yep. material in there? And yeah, and the original Calamity of Challenge number one twenty seven, which was the mini comic that I did that was about the the group that that Kanker was part of called the Challenge Acceptors. I've been a lot of people have asked me to reprint that and I've been really hesitant because I'm not happy with the art, but I just figured 
with a Kickstarter, you know, people know what they're getting into. It's not like I'm trying to sell it to average Joe off the street who walks into an LCS and they're like, well, this art looks really horrible. Like I'll explain to people like, this is the first thing I did with this. And that's why it, <laughs> right. it's not as, as polished as the rest of the book. And you have the rest of the work to compare it with in the, sure. in the following pages too. So yeah. yeah, that's excellent. I'm, I'm with your wife. I like the idea of if, if you've worked through it, I like the idea of seeing Kankor work through it. <laughs> yeah. You know, he's, that's that's actually a genius, you know, idea, especially on a book that's so personal. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, that's that's definitely going to happen. Uh, I, I'm I'm working on a a horror story right now. It'll be black and white. It'll be part of my Sweet Sepulcher yes. series. I, I did a couple mini comics. Yes. And um, this is going to be a a one shot that's got some personal stuff in it. That's that's more about my dad and his brothers. Uh, than anything in my in my life, but it is somewhat related, obviously, because of the connection there. But um, that's the next original work that I'm going to do, and I'll probably do a Kickstarter for that as well. And I'm hoping to get that done by the end of the year. Awesome, excellent. It was exciting to see, even just from us for the outside looking in, how well received the last book was. Like, I mean, it seemed like everyone kind of collectively lost their mind and ordered that from you. Like, yeah, I was completely underprepared for the amount of orders I got that day than I that I put it up on my website and uh it threw me for a loop and it was a good thing. It was a very good thing to have that kind of support and and that level of enthusiasm, but uh uh I had to quickly learn a lot about the post office and uh, <laughs> I already knew quite a bit about the post office to be angry with them anyway, but uh that this was uh, more of a trial by fire than I had hoped for. But we got through it, and and most everybody has their books now. So, yeah, yeah, that was incredible. Like it was, it was great to see that. And I mean, what a good problem. And uh, they, I don't know, the, it's just such a good current state of the world that you could do that. You know, to, like you can make something, put it up yourself, and and get that overwhelming response directly from your fans. That's incredible. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah, it seems like things have shifted a lot uh, in the past year and a half um, to much more direct relationship stuff, um, I guess, on a larger scale. Um, there was always that happening, but um, I'm really pleased to see that happening in the industry. Um, so I have a, a few like um, maybe craft or, or conceptual questions as well, um, okay. which is like... Um, in the book you take for example like the sound effects or the emanata and you make <laughs> them uh, pieces of the story like physical objects within the story and yeah. I remember when I first bought the book I had issues at two and three which is like all Kankor stuff like very little of the, the story behind it um, and it struck me as the most comics comic, you know, because the, the boundaries were limitless. I mean, you have panel borders, but even those can be like a ledge that Cancor swings off of. Sure. Um, yeah. What were some of the influences behind making that uh, part of the book? Like, did you see others doing that or were you like, hey, what if I did this, you know, just out of the blue? Um, you know, I definitely seen uh, Jim Rugg do it. Um, I remember getting the first uh, Street Angel collection from Ad House, and Jim would do that quite often where someone would get punched and the sound effects would be flying and you could see that they were three-dimensional and actually in the scene. So I definitely swiped that from him. Um, and then also, I didn't even realize it at the time I had the, the sequence in the first book where Kankor grabs the letter E off the end of the word mm -hmm. challenge and flies off with it. And I realized after the fact, you know, much later that that was from the old uh, PBS show Electric Company. And there was a character on there <laughs> named Letterman <laughs> who Excellent. would, like, somebody would have the word tube up in the sky and he would come and take the E off and it would become tub or, you know, he'd put the E on or whatever. And, uh, I, you know, it was one of those things I was like, oh, I should have Kankor do this. And then after, after the fact, I was like, oh, that's totally stole it from, <laughs> from that cartoon. 
So those those are the two big influences on that aspect of it. Awesome. Well, I know one that we both really liked when you first showed me the book was actually, and it was like the, oh, yeah. the sound effect sort of jab, and he actually pulls it out and stabs the, you know. Let me see if I can find it's, it in here. I think it's an issue. Do and you know, actually, that's that's one of the errors in the book. This There's book. actually a page missing there. I had a full, yeah. well, I think a partial splash of him getting stabbed with that. And when I was putting the PDF together to print, I left that page out. And it wasn't until the person who um, actually purchased that original art from me got the book. And they're like, hey, what happened to my page? And I flipped through it. I was like, oh, man, I can't believe I did that. I completely <laughs> oh, no. left that out. So the the collected edition will definitely have that uh, that page put back in. Oh, yeah. I see that now. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah, I just when he showed that to me, I was just like, oh, that's "Yeah, that absolutely fucking genius." That like the, you. <laughs> the sound effect, you know, or the impact has been taken and used actually as a weapon, and just was, yeah. I don't know, unbelievably genius. Thanks. So, sometimes I get to interview cartoonists for um, Strangers Fanzine, and I, I love to do it because I get to ask whatever I want, but I also get to ask. Um, what are some things that you would want to be asked? You know, like what are the things that are like on the edge of your mind in an interview where you're like, Oh, I wish I would ask this, or I think about this a lot and I never get asked about it. Hmm, that's a good question. Cause there are, there are a lot of things that I, that I go over in my head again and again. And, and, uh, I want to hear them. Well, if you're willing, to you share. know, I mean, just in terms of a more technical side of things, um, you know, this this book is pretty much sold out, and people are asking if I have more, and I, you know, there's clearly a demand for it. And the same thing happened with the Ad House book; that sold out way quicker than we had anticipated at all. And um, you know, so people are are saying, "Well, why wouldn't you go back to print with that?" And um, with this new book, it's partly just because I'm I'm so behind on commissions that going through the process of getting more printed, putting them on the site and shipping, I, I can do that a little bit later. But with the Ad House book, it was um, it was a situation where uh, you know Chris Pitzer, uh, the the owner of Ad House, um, he didn't anticipate that we were going to sell that many, so you know he he lowballed the the print run a little bit, and um, I didn't question it. You know, it's, it was more than what I was selling in terms of you know my individual issues, so I was fine with that. And uh, it became a matter of reinvestment. So it was like, okay, we can take the profit of this book and print more, or you can use that money to pay bills, which I needed to do. Mm -hmm. So just in terms of the, the, the answer to that question that people have asked me is like, why didn't you print more of the ad house book? It was like, cause I needed to make a car payment and, right. um, and pay <laughs> my income tax. So, uh, it was really, you know, just down to finances more than anything. I'd love to have more of those books to sell to people, but it just, um, uh, you know, it, it wasn't feasible. So I think Kickstarter is definitely the, the answer to that. How do you, figure out well how many should you print well you you find out ahead of time through crowdsourcing yeah uh, so that's probably the method that i'm going to use here on out as opposed to trying to find another publisher yeah that's a smart move because you know you've you've gotten the reach with not only your own you know reputation and and with your own work but uh also through being exposed to perhaps a wider audience through ad house. So now you've got even more people coming in interested in your work. Um, yeah. Yeah. Kickstarter seems to be a very straightforward, direct relationship thing. And it's like, look, if you, if you want to get on board, here's your chance. Yeah. Um, gosh, let me think of, I'm still kind of uh, reeling <laughs> a little bit. Well, I had one that I was going to bring up. Is that, uh, so, uh, I didn't realize till today that I guess for, for heavy, can, I'm not sure can, if you can see this, but I've got the high on fire record and I was just looking, you know, looking up stuff and was like, 
I didn't realize you did something with uh, Phil Hester for Spewing from the Earth oh, from the yeah. High on Fire record. And I was curious how that happened. Like, I'm, we actually run High on Fire. Well, we run one of High on Fire's official stores. That was in oh, heavy wow. metal, right? Yeah. 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 And I didn't know about that until I, I, I looked it up and I was like, holy shit, I didn't, I didn't even know about this. So, um, yeah. And, and, and also, I'm a big Phil Hester fan. So, on all fronts, it was like really interesting for me. But how did that happen? <laughs> Uh, it, it fell into my lap, um, at C2E2 in 2018, I believe I was there talking to, uh, Justin Molman, who's one of the editors at heavy metal. And, uh, he was telling me about how they were doing this music issue and they were going to have a bunch of writers. I think they'd already done one of these music issues before. And basically the idea is you take a song by you know usually a heavy metal uh, act and then have a writer interpret that song into a story and then team them up with an artist so he's talking to me and he's telling me he's like yeah we got all these uh bands lined up for this and he's listing them and he gets to high on fire and i'm like i want to do that i want to do the high on fire story i don't care who's writing it i don't care what song it is like that's the one i want to do because they're uh, in terms of metal bands they're you know up there um at the top of my my favorite of all time so um it was super exciting to get that opportunity and he's like oh yeah that's perfect we don't have an artist for that yet um of course i feel like i just completely failed on every level with that story Uh, phil's script described those creatures that are in there um much in much more detail and because of the the deadline that i had i basically had two weeks to thumbnail pencil ink and color that entire thing what um yeah which i mean it was only eight pages but for me like getting something like that done in two weeks is insane like i'm used to taking six months to do a 24 page book so i had to cut a lot of corners but um regardless i was you know thrilled at the the opportunity to do that and work with phil i knew phil a little bit from meeting him at conventions and um so that was, I was very happy to, to find out he was going to be the writer on it. And I thought he came up with a really cool story. That's amazing. Yeah. We, basically the same. I, we ended up uh, with an offer to do a, like a couple exclusive shirts for them mm-hmm. and where we actually had a hand in designing them and working with the artists. And, uh, and just recently it's been turned over to where we're going to be doing like an, a full like official store instead of just a couple of exclusive items to us we'll be running a store full store for them and i'm a huge oh, great. fucking fan of that band <laughs> so yeah well then I, f- I just found out that uh um the drummer from big business is now their drummer and big oh, wow. business is like again another band like i, I thanked big 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 business in the ad house book and now knowing that he's he's their new drummer yeah. it's like it couldn't possibly get any better i love the iteration of the melvins that was the melvins yeah. in big business that was the greatest live band of all fucking time like yeah amazing shows like that was yeah the first time i saw them i think in that version was them opening for down and i mean they blew every band off the stage that night and just the was power that of those when they two had drummers the- yeah, and they had the drum set up where it was mirrored. Like uh, yeah. Jared from Big Business was actually dressed like King Buzzo. He had the big hair and everything. <laughs> I don't know. They weren't. They weren't for this one. They weren't dressed okay. the same. But yeah, they. But they watching the two of them like playing at each other. It, it, a, it looked like the most fun I've ever seen any two yeah. dudes have in their entire life. And the two drummers at once was the most powerful thing I'd ever seen. So yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. Big business is great. And that version of the Melvins is hands down my fucking favorite. Yep. But yeah, that's crazy. That's really cool that you got to work with high on fire. And then I actually, uh, as soon as I saw that, I was like, oh, I wonder if we can get, you know, Matthew to do a shirt for high on fire. And if we can get high on fires manager to approve that, cause uh, my brain's already immediately started wrapping itself around that. <laughs> well, let me know because what happened with heavy metal is they ended up taking pages from that and making shirts of those pages oh wow without telling me that that's what they were doing and so when i saw that i was like oh no no don't do that because you take these pages out of context it's like it doesn't make sense to have that as a shirt yeah uh so i was like man why didn't you come to me i would have drawn in a completely new 
right. design. Like it's, so. Well, maybe I, I'm definitely going to mention this now that I realize that connection today. I'm absolutely sure. going to be mentioning to their management, and then was yeah, going please to do try and talk to you and see if we can make that happen. That sounds incredible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, um, are there any other like bands that you would want to work with in that capacity? Yeah, or in general, like how has music influenced your art? Like, what's how does music inspire you? Like, because obviously, I see you're in a plasmatic shirt, and we now realize, you know, you 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 were excited to work with High and Fire. So, like, how has music inspired you? Um, you know, I'm very much into any bands that um, you know go off the beaten path in terms of creating sounds and and songs that you know wouldn't get played on the radio obviously you know there's a lot of experimental elements to uh to the melvins you know they'll do noise rock stuff and and just long songs that are nothing but static and crazy sounds and uh the band that i listened to the most actually besides big business when i was working on canker was steely dan yes and i I think the thing that inspired me with them was just the the sardonic nature of their lyrics. And everybody uses that word when they describe Seely Dan, it seems like. So I so apologies for, for just saying the same shit everybody else says. It is but true, um man. Yeah, and, and and there's a certain uh you know, they're they're creating rock music, but doing it in a way that's very subversive and writing about things that don't necessarily match the type of music that they're playing. Right. You know, a song about a drug overdose or, you know, uh, creepy next door neighbors. Like that was inspiring. Cause it, it felt like, well, I can make superhero comics, but they don't have to conform to what superhero comics normally are. I can just use that iconography and those types of figures and costumes and, and, manipulate them however i want so um you know in that regard i think you know a band like that is is uh uh you know something that definitely fueled that for me excellent um so kind of going back to the work with phil hester um you know in a collaborative effort you know you sort of exercise different muscles than you do when you're creating it all yourself um, is that something that, so comparing the two, creating Cancor and doing everything yourself and having a collaborative effort, which one is more attractive to you at this phase in your career? Are you still oh. interested in doing collaborations? And Not really, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, as, as, as great as Phil is and, and as perfectly, um, crafted as his script was i i felt like i disappointed him i felt like i let him down and i don't have to worry about that if i'm just working with myself i don't have to you know it's i i i'm in complete control of it and whatever works works whatever fails fails but i'm not affecting someone else's life because he spent time working on that thing and he put things in that script that i it was only after i got the physical copy in my hand i was like oh man i can't believe i left that out he vividly described this one part of that story that i did not it didn't register with me so just in in terms of that um you know i i just don't want to put myself in a position where i'm i'm failing somebody else mm. and then on top of that you know i've i've been working in 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 print shops and and working retail and all this stuff since i was 16 years old and and I, I love just being isolated in a room, not being beholden to anybody else. I'm not worried about what somebody's playing on, on their stereo next to me. I'm not worried about somebody bringing me more work. Like it's all me. And so to have that freedom of just complete control and complete autonomy, it's very hard for me to give that up now at, at age 48. I, I don't, I don't want to, um, relinquish any of that freedom and control right now do you, just out of curiosity is do you just personally feel like you let phil down like is that something more like internal like you just feel like you let him down or, or 
Yeah, he never said anything but I was just curious, nice things yeah. about what I had done. Um, and in fact, he bought a page from it from me. So I, I, I completely understand that because I, I mean, we're all incredibly hard on ourselves, harder than yeah. anyone else could be. But I was just curious because I was I was having a hard time imagining he was actually disappointed and was curious if it was more your own. Yeah, I, I it's that's all in my head. Yeah, I I have no idea what he, you know, if he had negative thoughts about it at all. I would imagine if he bought a page from you, he didn't. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I hope so. He's so I'm going to guess that he, that's your own, you know, your own, and we all have. Well, them, yeah. to be fair, that guy's a massive art collector, and he basically has at least one piece from every artist that's ever made comics. So I, I'm sure he still didn't buy anything he didn't want. So. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and still say that he probably <laughs> really liked it. <laughs> um. Go go ahead. Okay. Well, I've got a couple other questions. Sure. Um, who, um, so who are you reading right now? And also, who do you see sort of coming down the pike? Um, like newer artists that are like, hey, this guy, he gets it. You know, I'm really zeroing in on his style. I'm tuning into that. That's really fresh. You know, like, what does that? Uh, what does that look like to you right now? <coughs> Excuse me. Um, well, to answer the first question, um, I just started rereading uh, Charles Burns' um, X'd Out books. I don't know if it's called C Crossed Out or X'd Out, Sugar Skull, uh, The Hive. I know that was all collected and there is a different title for it. But um, the last big thing that, uh, that Charles Burns had done a few years ago, and I'm reading it because I there's a lot of elements in there that are similar to what I was doing with the Kankor stuff. And I, at the time when I got those books, I was like, Oh man, I can't look at this. Cause I don't want to be influenced by it at all. Mm. Uh, Cause he was doing some of the same stuff I was doing, having characters exist in different iterations of themselves. And um, so I felt like it was a good time to go back and, and read that now that I'm technically done with Kankor. Uh, I've been on a big, uh, Basil Wolverton kick. Um, I got my wife got me the uh, Wolverton Bible, uh, oh, wow. all his Bible illustrations that he had done uh, through the 30s, 40s, and 50s. Maybe not the 30s, but uh, like with uh, Max Gaines, like classics. I mean, like the like no, the pre EC he, stuff. No, it's actually I, let me rephrase that. He it, it was like post 1950. He ended up becoming a born again Christian in the late 40s early 50s and he hooked up with this church and started doing illustrations for these bible stories that they were reprinting what and fanographics reprinted all that in a book that's now out of print and um so it's just wild insane beautifully drawn stuff all about the apocalypse essentially amazing oh, wow. um and so i'm that's my big influence on this new Sweet Sepulchre book that I'm doing is his illustration style for that stuff. Uh, so I, I definitely had to dig that out and um, start going through that again. Excellent. Wow. I'm going to have to look that. And then in that. terms of new guys, um, Matt Lisniewski. Oh, uh, yeah. He's, yeah, he's another Inky Knuckles guy, and his stuff infuriates me. It's so good. He's <laughs> a, an amazing illustrator, amazing inker. Uh, you know the static book he just put out, the yeah. freak that went, came out through Ad House. Um, I'm just incredibly envious of of him, and I, I feel like he's he's the person that 10, 15 years from now is going to be looked at like Charles Burns or Dan Klaus. I'm wow. pretty sure. Yeah. Wow. Do you have any more questions? Um, just because we're getting close to when I know you got to go um, because of your your wife's class. So I want to make sure you. <laughs> Yeah, I'm just I'm worried about the Wi-Fi getting spotty, so we can try going longer. But you know, there's there's a potential issue with the the Wi-Fi. Well, we want to be respectful of that as well. Um, I, I'm trying I appreciate to think that. of um, anything else that I would want to ask. I will think of it uh, as soon as we're done. That's probably what's going <laughs> to sure. happen. I guarantee. Well, I can always come back. <laughs> I I take full responsibility. I was too dedicated to surprising him, but my way around it was that I told him we were doing an episode where we discussed your work. Yeah. So I was yeah. like, okay. you should be yeah. you should be ready. So <laughs> Well, I was going to talk about myself and my experiences with it and and I don't 
that would be completely inappropriate to do, (laughs) you know, just like drone on about that. Um, so, uh, your books mean a lot to me, man. I really, really appreciate it. You've taught me a lot of stuff as a cartoonist and, you know, I learned, uh, uh, line weight from watching you, um, just posting your videos and I'm like, Oh, it makes a difference, you know, like, yeah, it just, it, it lends so much character and I see sure, it yeah. now as it's, as it's happening and before my eyes. Okay. Let me pick that up and try and incorporate that into my, into my own work. So, um, yeah, I'm huge fan, man. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you for, con- for continuing, you know? Yeah. I, again, like we did that episode and I don't remember anything you picked except this because I think I immediately was kind of, overly absorbed with this one yeah. and then he was kind enough to loan it to me and i returned it he did I'm go on record that i returned it he sure did because <laughs> there was a question as to whether i would or not <laughs> <laughs> and then he bought two copies of anamnesis and he was like don't buy this i got you one and i'm like oh shit i'm already his pay- uh, on his patreon so i'm getting one <laughs> well <in the> mail. <laughs> you can always flip them on ebay because <laughs> oh, i so my friend chuck didn't get one so i mailed it to him lucky so, chuck yeah, oh, lucky chucky I, I make sure he stays in comics so I, it worked out fine, and I mailed him one. So, um, so you don't it, you don't have any plans on reprinting that, or you're just going to wait for the collected edition? Or I mean, is it purely financial that you don't want to reprint it yet, or is it is it? It's more the time wait? frame yeah. of just you know, uh, you know, knowing that I've got these commissions that I got to finish up, and and how much time that's going to take. Um, you know, I just I I because I I publish stuff so infrequently i don't have a real good system for sitting down and packaging everything you know the 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 people that are putting stuff out every month they're either using a fulfillment house that takes care of that stuff for them or they've just got it down to a science so it's more about just the the thought of going through that again fulfilling all those orders is is it gives me agita (laughs) i'm really glad you came on and 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 you're your book is amazing and uh you know it's just it's again it was super exciting to see everybody respond the way they did you know because uh, i'm a pretty new fan to you you know to what you're doing because it's only been a couple months mu- i started following you once david showed it to me and yeah uh, you were like how am i not following this dude yeah yeah i legitimately felt that way and then and then i saw like that just like every everybody like go crazy when that came out and i was excited to see that because i you know your work is wonderful and it's it's cool to see everybody like actually throw it in support and it was again like just such a cool time like people are i think collectively people are really starting to rally around the actual artists they like instead of the entities that that maybe you know like where instead of comic companies or record labels people are actually starting to rally around the melvins instead of you know whoever the you know whoever the label that would have put it out was yeah, it, it makes total sense. I mean, and that's that's how I am as a reader and a collector. You know, I, I don't care if my favorite artist is being published by Dark Horse or DC. It doesn't matter. I just, I'm following them. Right. And, um, you know, it's 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 a great thing to be able to, to have a more immediate connection with somebody, um, you know, doing it yourself for sure. Yeah. And it, it's I think it goes both ways. It's super fulfilling for the, you know, like for the fan to be able to support you directly and get something directly from you. That's, you know, that's such a more personal relationship. And I, and would of course, in, you know, like I think it'd build a longer lasting bond between the artist and the person support, you know, the fan. Hopefully. Yeah. Exist. And, uh, especially in this day and age where, you know, a lot of things being only digital and like, people like supporting that physical content from you is going to be something that's more meaningful in the long run. Definitely. Yeah. So. Thanks so much, man. Thanks for your time. Yeah. Thank you guys. I really appreciate it. And like I said, I, I would be glad to be on again. And, uh, um, I, uh, I, I didn't even know you guys were doing this. So I'm definitely want to check it out. I've, I've caught up on all my other podcasts, so I'm going to go back and listen to some more. Mm-hmm.